Okay. Everyone is filtering in. There we go. All right. Um, won't delay any further. So, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bashan. Welcome to another PNP Live. I am part of the event staff with Politics and Prose. Before we get started with this event, uh, just a couple of quick items that I would like to cover. The first being, if at any time you'd like to ask a question of our featured guest, we would ask for you to place it into the Q&A box, which you can find towards the bottom of your screen. Uh, that will help us keep stuff organized uh, when it comes to the question and answer period. Uh, in addition to that, when you go to the chat section, you'll be able to find links that will take you directly to the Politics and Pros website where you can purchase a copy of Woody Guthrie. Of course, we highly encourage you to do so, and we would thank you for any patronage as that continues to allow us to bring you these live events. The timely, passionate, and humanely political work of America's greatest folk singer and songwriter is presented through his own words and art curated by Woody's daughter and this essential self-portrait, including never before published lyrics and personal writing and testimony from contemporary writers and musicians on his powerful relevance today. Nora Guthrie is the daughter of Woody Guthrie and president of Woody Guthrie Publications. She served as the president of the Woody Guthrie Foundation for over 30 years, founded the Woody Guthrie Archive in 1992, and the Woody Guthrie Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2013. She is the executive producer of numerous Grammy award-winning albums, recording hundreds of her father's previously unknown lyrics. She was joined today in conversation by Mr. Douglas Brinkley, the Catherine Sanoff Brown Chair in Humanities and Professor of History at Rice University, best-selling author, Grammy award-winning producer, and presidential historian for CNN, and a contributor to this book here. <laughs> Without any further ado, I turn the floor over to you. Well, it's wonderful to be back with politics and prose, really to celebrate Woody Guthrie and Nora Guthrie. Um, the book, Woody Guthrie, Songs and Art, Words and Wisdom, Nora Guthrie with Bob Santelli. Uh, it is just a remarkable project. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to write a, an essay for it, along with Roseanne Cash, Chuck D., Annie DeFranco, Jeff Daniels, and Arlo Guthrie. And Nora, uh, I wanted to begin by just asking you, um, when did you last, um, uh, when did you last uh, listen to Woody Guthrie's music, your dad's music? Do you listen to it every day? <laughs> Um, well, I have a radio station that I listen to, Folk Alley, and they play his music, not just him, but other people who do his songs pretty often. So that's kind of my the soundtrack of my office life. Yes, I listen to him a lot. Does one, one of the, the great compositions speak to you in a personal way that when you hear it, you, you feel that that's my, uh, the soul of my father? Uh, I, I can't say there's one song. I think that as the day goes on, and we could talk about this as we go through, through some of the book too, uh, every day there's a different song that's relevant to what's happening in the news. And that's what kind of is eerie to me. It's unbelievable that as I listen to the news, every day there's like, oh my God, there's that song. Oh my God, there's this song. He's talking about this song, that song. So I think it's like, a soundtrack to life, you know? And that's what Bob Dylan said. Bob Dylan said, you can listen to Woody Guthrie songs and you learn how to live. So I think it's a much broader thing than a topic. It's not topical, it's life affirming. There's so many lyrics in this book, uh, photographs, the artwork is stupendous. This is now housed down in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the Woody Guthrie Center. Tell us about the center. How did it end up in Tulsa? And um, what would one experience if they got the opportunity to go there? Well, the center was set up about eight years ago and we wanted to settle him. He needs to be settled somewhere. I'm getting old, you can tell here. And uh, it was time to make certain decisions like where do we want to have him live? And I really wanted him to be in Oklahoma. I wanted him to be back in the 
middle of the country, back with his people. These are the people he loved. These are his relative. And these are the people he wrote about. You know, he's talking about with the Dust Bowl and the depression and all this stuff happening. These are his people. And I thought, uh, instead of everyone kind of abandoning the Midwest or something like that, it was time to come together again and bring him back home. Yeah, and it's in the art district in Tulsa. And now this um, spring Bob Dylan Center is opening next to it. And, it's, and you have Kane's Ballroom in Tulsa. And the, um, of course, we've been dealing with the Tulsa massacre, the riot that took place there, and that's being memorialized. So it's really becoming a fascinating place to study American history. And one aspect of it, Nora, maybe you can comment on is so it used to be a progressive tradition in Oklahoma. Today, we think of it as sort of a conservative or red state, although not in urban centers necessarily. But uh, wh what was that progressive movement in Oklahoma all about? I would ask you that question. I think you're the historian that knows more about it than I do. I mean, my father writes about it in his uh, in different works, and he talks about uh, all the socialist parties that started in Oklahoma. I think there was like eleven or something like that at some point. You probably know better than I do. Yeah, and that uh, you know, I I know some about it. And one of the uh, that one of the big things that were going going on there is just uh, farms that were foreclosing. Uh, the big banks running shotgun over the little guy. Um, and then, of course, you get the ecological catastrophe going on of the Dust Bowl. And although there's so many sides, and what I love about this book, it's not just Woody Guthrie, Dust Bowl Balladeer, and his famous Dust Bowl album came out in 1940, uh, but the, the songs um, that he wrote are just so memorable. But it's really about surviving that cataclysm um, and there. And I, I, you know, when you think about the Dust Bowl, people don't realize, I mean, the, we had really denuded the Midwest and the Great Plains. Uh, we drained wetlands. Um, we had not yet through FDR had, um, you know, forest blocks. Uh, FDR would, would do a Z kind of a massive forest to try to stop the wind from just blowing all the topsoil away. And uh, Woody Guthrie experienced the, the Dust Bowl in, in Pampa uh, and, and elsewhere, and of course fled to go to California. And it seemed like the, um, the Okies were being left behind and that they, there was still a vibrant labor movement, um, which Woody Guthrie was such a seminal part of. And, and if you look through the book, it's amazing how often there you'll read lyrics about the union and and um, you know, and the like. Um, but the ecolog we look at the the Dust Bowl as really the key ecological disaster. And then, so when you said, Nora, about it recycles back when we're looking at climate change today and drought and wildfire fires and displacement, uh, studying what happened to people in the Dust Bowl with drought. Um, and, and, you know, those dust bowls, dust storms were gigantic. I mean, people don't realize that it just wasn't dust blowing between the cracks of a door or maybe choking livestock or forcing you to wear a scarf around your face, but it was, it was huge and menacing. And the, the idea of blacking out the sky and it's, a, and it sort of looks like ink uh, and you can't see, you know, three feet in front of you. It was a phenomena. Uh, that one doesn't want to ever see happen again, but with global drought and deforestation and the abuse, ecological abuse of the environment, um, one worries. And yet Woody Guthrie, of course, as you know, put his heart into all of those, um, those um, ballads about real everyday people. And you, they, know, you, were, you were asking before about the archive in Tulsa, what's in there and everything. And I just want to Go, going back to the book for a second, I kind of created the book as a mini archive in a way. The first thing that'll that'll stick out, if I can show, show you some images, is the color, because he was very colorful. And most people think of him as kind of a sepia tone, gray and black, you know, white kind of tones. And he was actually very, he was a colorful character, and he did everything in color. So just as a prelude to the book in a way, I just wanted to point that out to everyone, that page after page after page 
uh, is in full color in his original coloring. And when we start out the book, we divided the book into uh, a number of chapters that I felt were essential to Woody's life, and not just Woody's life, to all of our lives. There are certain things that we all share in common that chisel us and shape us into who we are. And that also keeps changing, by the way. It's not set in stone. And the first thing we talk about in the book is his sense, his sense of himself, his self-identity, what he writes about himself, who he thinks he is, who he wants to be. And then we go to locations, different places around the country. We can just show you some of the pictures um, if they can come up. Yeah. That's the beautiful cover, by the way, everyone, <laughs> with a couple of one of my favorite things about my dad is his quips. He had an amazing sense of humor, uh, very much admired by uh, that he admired people like Will Rogers and stuff, that Midwestern humor. And he writes on the side of this book, you can see one of his little lines says, a folk song is what's wrong and how to fix it. <laughs> Period. Well, also, <laughs> also, take it easy, but take it. Right. I think of that one um, a lot. Um, from the cover, but go on and tell me about the- uh, Yeah, so I'm just gonna go to, go to his self-identity if we can, yeah. So one of the things I'm gonna talk very personally because the difference that this book is from any other book that's been written is first of all, I knew him. <laughs> and so there's a completely different relationship and he was he's my family. So I saw him from every different perspective not just as a folk singer, but as a man, as a father, as a humorist or whatever. Um, and one of the things that I love that I felt gave me permission to grow is this line that we found in one of his diaries. And it says, I am a changer, a constant changer. I have to be or die because whatever stops changing is dead and I'm alive. And I thought, oh, God bless because especially in today's world that we live in, it feels like everyone is putting down stakes and posts. Um, you know, I, I'm this and I'm that, you're this and you're that. And I thought, oh my God, where's the freedom to breathe and to grow and to change? I could feel one way or think one way one day. And then the next day I read something, I run into someone, I change my mind. And it, it was very much a... Um, a a motto for his life because he started out as you know a kid in Oklahoma with not much education and he grew as he traveled around the country and as he learned things he grew he changed so that's the how we open the book with him giving his self-portrait we also included in the book a lot of the original lyrics where he talks about where he was born this is uh, in the Oklahoma hills where I was born and I just have to point out one of the interesting things about this lyric is that he really does mention all the Indian tribes that are part of Oklahoma that make up. And so he, he says, I'm living in the tribal lands in the Oklahoma hills where I was born. It's kind of interesting that he um, makes a point of that also. Is that song still the, um, the state song of Oklahoma, do you know? I don't know. Well, somebody write in and let us know. I think it yeah. is. I hear yeah. it there, I, and uh, it, it was for a long time. So we go from Oklahoma Hills, and then this is really interesting. One of the lyrics that I included that nobody really knows is called When I Was a Little Boy. And he talks about uh, when I was a little boy, first I had to grow, then I had to guess, and then I had to know. First I played marbles and I next played ball, but I had to study fighting most of all, most of all. I had to study fighting most of all. And then the lyric goes on. And I thought that's also a very interesting aspect of how his character was chiseled. Uh, the image here is from Bound for Glory where the kids are in gangs and they're fighting. And so that's very much in his being to be a fighter from the beginning. One of the things that also shaped his early childhood was his mother. Uh, unbeknownst to everybody, his mother started developing symptoms of Huntington's disease in her 30s. Woody was just a little boy. 
the artwork that you see is him consoling his mother with the grandmother holding her. It's also from Bound for Glory. And he writes this song, Mother Sing Again. And he talks about in the lyric that it was his mother who sang all the ballads to him. It was through his mother's voice that he learned songwriting because she's the one who sang all the, the ballads. Uh, she was originally kind of Scots-Irish descent. So I thought that was really beautiful. It's, it's one of the very few very personal lyrics uh, or writings in general that he covers. And then as you were talking up about before, we come to the great dust storm era, the Dust Bowl era. And I included this lyric, the great dust storm, but I also included an excerpt from an interview that he did. And I thought this was, this is just pure Woody. The words that you see on the screen are again, uh, transcribed from an interview that we did. And it, he says, well, they asked him, why did you write about the Dust Bowl? He says, well, I sort of like to write about wherever I happen to be. And I just happened to be in the Dust Bowl. I mean, it wasn't something particularly I craved for, but since I was there and the dust was there, well, I thought I better write a little song about it. And then he goes on, it gives you some insight again into his sense of presence in his lyrics. And that's something that you find over and over and over again in just about every lyric. He's there now. He's completely present in, in his uh, persona when he's talking about it. So that's just to give people a little bit of an idea of how he was shaped and chiseled in his life. How many, um, how many drawings are, uh, how, I mean, he started out as, uh, as a painter, right? Of, of doing signs for businesses in Oklahoma. Was the visual arts a equally significant part of his career, do you think? He actually started out being a painter um, he painted signs, he painted windows, he painted portraits of famous people that people, local neighbors wanted to have a nice painting on their wall. And he would paint pictures of Jesus and Lincoln and Washington and all the famous characters in American history. Um, he talks about traveling across the country during, after the Dust Bowl happened and he was on his way to California and he carried brushes in his pocket to make his way across country. He would get into a town, he would see a sign that needed fixing up and he would go to the people and say, I'll fix your sign for a bowl of chili and a place to stay. And that's how he worked his way across the country. And then one day, the people he was hitchhiking with drove off with his paintbrushes. So he couldn't do that anymore. So he went into a saloon, picked up a guitar and played a song. They gave him a nickel. And they, if they liked the song, they'd say, play it again. And they'd give him another nickel. <laughs> and he realized, and he writes this, and it's in the book. He says, I realized that a painting, you do it once, they give you a dollar, it's on the wall, and that's the end of it. But a song, if they like it, they sing it again and again and again. And every time you get a nickel. <laughs> so this, again, during the dust storm in the Depression era, that's how he financially that's how his brain worked that songs were going to pay better yeah but, and i was amazed at how many of, of just color splashes on letters or lyrics or what some might call cartoons or or doodling and the amount of humor that's that comes out of woody guthrie uh, um when you're reading that tell me about this your father's um sense of uh, you know kind of comic timing in the way he would deliver lines and jokes. Well, you can see it in this lyric. For instance, the last verse, there was always, he would tell a story, but then he would kind of flip the last verse. And in this one, it's about being homeless. Ain't got no home in this world anymore, right? But then he takes the last verse. He says, well, now as I look around, it's very plain to see. This world is such a great and funny place to be. The gambling man is rich. And the working man is poor. And I ain't got no home in this world anymore. Bada beam, bada boom, as we say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he just nails it. The There's gambling men are rich and the working people are poor. Hello. <laughs> Infrastructure yeah. week. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. And, you know, it's just, it's a constant thread throughout. Uh, 
And you're, I was, some of the portraits, like with Abraham Lincoln portrait, it looked like he was trying to do a genuine portrait. I don't know, for somebody. Uh, I was surprised to see it in the book. Um, did do you do you think your father had political heroes, people in politics that he admired? Well, he does write about them. He has lyrics like "Christ for President." Uh, he loved FDR, et cetera. When we there's a section in the book that we'll get to about people, and he writes about the people that he admires. So maybe we could just move on to yeah. the next section. Uh, I'll tell you who he didn't admire: uh, vigilante men. And I thought, I mean, considering what's happening in the news this week, and here he is writing about vigilantism uh, many, many years, decades before. And he, you know, one again with the line, would you, would you shoot your brother and sister down? You know, these are your people, et cetera. Uh, his experience with vigilantism, uh, was, actually it's one of my favorite songs actually, when you asked before. And this one seems to constantly be important. And there's the artwork that goes with it too, of the vigilantism that went on. Um, when he traveled across the country, he went from a small town boy. This is part of that changing that I'm talking about, the growing. When he got out of Okima and then later on got out of Texas, I found this beautiful piece of writing that he, that's in a diary. And he said, I never did know that the human race was this big before. I never really did know that the fight had been going on for so long and it was so bad. Now he's talking about the labor movement fight when he gets to California and he discovers, my God, first of all, all these people are living in tents, uh, the migrants coming from Oklahoma, Kansas, Georgia, Tennessee from the Dust Bowl but, and migrant workers that are out there in the fields. He gets quickly educated to the situation and he writes a lot about it in his work. But I love the fact that he admits, I never did know that the world was this big. I never did know that there were so many problems. And I feel like I'm sure you do too, especially with the internet, every day we're learning more and more and more about what goes on in the world. I never did know, I can say that, I never did know what happened here or happened there, I'm learning. Uh, here's a little bit of a sense of humor you were asking about. I love this little line that he writes at the bottom of this drawing, sometimes I think I ain't nothing but an old piece of dirt walking. <laughs> I know, I like it. <laughs> Talk about a little humility, right? <laughs> So we have a chapter also about the places that he traveled. That's so much a part of his uh, being, uh, the places I've been. And uh, we could just go briefly. We talk about California. Since the song is from California to the New York Island, we included some lyrics about California. One on one side is California Stars, which is a love song. I wish I was back under California Stars. And the other side is if you ain't got the do re mi, you can't get into California. <laughs> they were stopping people at the border. You had to have X amount of money on you to, you know, to cross into the California border, which is not really legal. Uh, so I thought that was interesting, two sides of, the, of his experience. And then he travels across the country, he gets to New York eventually. And this is a wonderful uh, moment for him. And he gets to New York and he writes, there's just one and only one New York. And if you don't see it, you're doing yourself and your country an injustice. It's got the best of the least for the most and the most of the best for the least. <laughs> there's his humor. And this, the, uh, go so ahead. He, he did, he, this photograph is actually taken in Bryant Park in Times Square, New York. And he was staying at a little flop house when he got to the city. And in the first week that he was in New York City, he wrote a couple of songs every single day. In one week, he wrote Jesus Christ and this land is your land in this little flop house. And when you look at his notebooks, how they're dated, the, the one before this land is your land was called Women's Hats, where he's just writing about women's, 
<laughs> these New York City women in their clothing. He also wrote a wonderful song called Government Road that talks about the government needing to take care of the roads and the infrastructure. I thought that was really also uh, looking ahead, right, is what we're going through right now. So he gets to New York and here's the original This Land is Your Land lyric. And you wrote about it in the book. Maybe you should talk about this song. Oh, well, I mean, you know, for one thing, and, and we're talking about politics, it's been the theme song for just about uh, everybody and anybody that they often misunderstand uh, it. I think George McGovern um, understood the song um, as it's meant to be sung, but, you know, it's, it was written um, as a protest or at least as a counterstatement um, to God Bless America um, by Irving Berlin. And, you know, it, it's a mystical art, as you know, Nora's songwriting, and the, this song is become so perfect. And I used to bust guitar play, um, and I always loved the, you know, the verse, you know, as, as I was walking, and I saw a sign there, and on that sign, it said no trespassing, and on the other side, it didn't say nothing at all. That side was made for you and me. That verse, when I was young, just felt very liberating. And I'm amazed now to how many artists have done versions of This Land is Your Land and then reinterpreted in their own way. And in the book, in the essay that I did, I talk about how um, many indigenous people have adopted the song and, and rewritten lyrics to it um, and, and to reflect some of their current um, sentiments about um, the, the horrific um, treatment they often get. And, in environmentalist use this song. Um, it's just one of those things that I, I can't, I really put it with the Declaration of Independence and uh, you know Gettysburg Address. Uh, it's sort of an heirloom uh, for that, that lives and grows and uh, has meaning all the time. It's a foundational text in many ways. And I mean, if, if you don't, it, to me, it is the national anthem of the United States. And I never have had one time in my life where I was tired of hearing the song, no matter who does it, I'm drawn in. So there, it, it has magic. And just seeing him and his handwriting in the cross outs as it's uh, reproduced in the books, just marvelous. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we also have a chapter on how to write songs for any of you musicians out there. And you want a couple of uh, tips on how to write songs. I love, I love this notebook because there's just notes flying all over the place. And being a union guy that he was, he writes, we got to get organized. <laughs> and that's what all the notes have to do. They got to get organized. And he writes a lot of things about what a song should be, could be. Uh, you can see the notebook there that says how to write songs. He, you know, he, he's pretty, you know, uh, spoke well spoken. He writes at the bottom a folk song is what's wrong and how to fix it. Or it could be who's hungry and where their mouth is or who's out of work and where the job is or who's broke and where the money is or who's carrying a gun and where the peace is. That's a folk song. Yeah, man, that, it's in. And you know what, Nora, just seeing when the, that page with the notes like that and reminding us about that sense of humor that he had, I guess that's what I was trying to say when you, it is really remarkable how often there's just a little something to put a smile on people's face. And yet he's so um, ardent in his politics, his disdain of fascism and um, his, uh, uh, his anger at Hitler. Um, his love of the so-called common people or everyday people of America, but he does it with a nod and a wink. And I guess that is the Will Rogers yeah. tradition. Um, and uh, it's, it's deep in the Oklahoma personality. Yeah, yeah. I know I have relatives in Oklahoma and they're just like that. Right. <laughs> Same <laughs> sense of humor. They crack me up. Yeah. But he is, <clears throat> one of the things that I love also that's in the book we included is a very simple idea of that he believed that the best way to write a song was to start with a title. And he writes, just the idea of a title is more than half the work. So he starts writing titles, possible titles, single girl blues, two hungry babies, starring, starving family blues, leaky roof blues, no money blues. And he goes on and on and on. 
there's actually page after page after page of these titles. I couldn't include them all in this presentation, <coughs> but there's about five more pages of possible titles. I was hoping some artist out there gets the book and decides to write a song uh, around one of the, the, the titles because there's some great ones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And listen, not to not to censor yourself. You never know where a, where a good song is going to come from. It could be a, a certain title that just triggers a really good idea. One of the songs that I found also was this called Song About Tipping. Now, Woody wrote some very short songs, but he also wrote some very long songs. This one, as you can see, probably has like 80 verses in it or something. I don't know. It's six pages, five pages long. And it's about tipping. And I thought, here we go again, because what's in the news? One fair wage, right? Yes. We all, we all know one fair wage, right? And here he is talking about he doesn't want to tip. He doesn't like tipping. People should have living wages. And he goes on and on. Would you tip your doctor? Do you tip your dentist? Do you tip a teacher? No, salaried. And he talks about people that work in the rail, in the restaurant business, people that work in the uh, transportation, et cetera. So I thought this was, again, just amazing. He's writing, and what is the date there? 1946. And he ends up, the last line is, so stop asking me for a tip. Go get your wages from your boss. <laughs> yeah, I know. And the, recently, I mean, it made some news a couple of years ago, but he had written a lyric that dealt with Donald Trump's father. Can you, do you know anything about that? The backstory sure, to that? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that in just okay. a minute if we can. All right. So just back to the songwriting thing, he also wrote about history and people, people asked me a lot about this. I learned a lot of history from his songs, things that were not taught in schools necessarily. And this is a really typical example of a song that was sung around our house called 1913 Massacre with a bunch of miners are celebrating Christmas and the thugs locked the doors of the party and screamed fire. and. 74 uh, children were smothered to death and trying to exit the place. So we included again, this idea of real history. There's the article, it's in the newspaper, it's been written about the children, you can see it's happening there. And he writes again, one of the most beautiful songs, 1913 Massacre, with that flip line I talked about before, how he always tries to bring it back to something we can do about it. What's the issue here? And the last line in 1913 Massacre is uh, the piano played a slow funeral tune and the town was lit up by a, a Christmas moon. The people they cried and the miners they moaned, see what your greed for money has done. He just nails it. It's all about greed. Uh, corporate greed, et cetera. So that's just one of the examples that we have in the book. And of course, this wonderful quip of his, we're talking about his sense of humor. Music is just a handy way of saying what's on your mind. No mind, no music. Yeah, I love it. Uh, we have another section called things that are right and things that are wrong, which really deals with political issues, a lot of it. And he writes, I'll use this guitar and I'll use a song to tell you things that are right and things that are wrong. And I, I really love his straightforwardness, I have to say. Um, I kind of miss that in today's world, actually. I just miss straight talk, you know, what's right and what's wrong? And, and does that touch you? Does that mean anything to you anymore? So as much as we talk about, we hear it in the news, immoral, morality, morality, this and that and that, and it's just, it doesn't seem to be, really in the soul, you know what I mean? Like people go, it's immoral, so what? You know, yeah. a lot of the politicians like, that's a lie, so what? You know, I can't, we've lost a lot of that uh, integrity, which is a shame. So he, he also used a lot of cartoons to tell you things that are right and things that are wrong. Uh, you can see in this one, the politician being shot out of the cannon and uh, the, the Note at the bottom says, yeah, I'll shoot, I'll shoot straight with you, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and then the one on the top is about housing. Only one third of the people are, are housed. So you have one third of the body fitting in the house. And at the bottom, 
all politics are they you know will fade away etc so there's a lot of uh, comic cartoons that he did as well and then there's this serious issue of fascism uh, he was when i said he could change every day one of the things he never changed about was fascism once he understood what it was it be, really became uh, a, a living cry for him for the rest of his life and one of the songs that we included was all you fascists bound to lose one of the things that i really like about this song is the repetition the mantra all you fascists bound to lose all you fat you just over and over and over again you say it you keep repeating it you build strength you build brain from it so uh it's a wonderful anti-fascist song that a lot of people have been actually playing lately and this idea of a guitar not so much as an instrument but more of a tool and he talks about his guitar as a tool a weapon to be used he says i my big gibson guitar has a sign i painted on it and it says this machine kills fascists he saw it as a machine that he could work with and he says that I, it means just what it says too so every guitar he ever had had that sign on it he painted it in different ways or taped it on or whatever there was never a guitar that didn't have that line on it another issue that was crucial to him was racism this is just a, a diary entry a lyric it was never recorded or never published or anything like that it's called it is jim crow and he talks again about uh Jim Crow and the lack of rights of, and he talks about black people. You're allowed to be a porter on the train, but you can't ride on the train. You can be a waiter in a restaurant, but you can't eat at that restaurant, et cetera. So it's, there was a ton of stuff about Jim Crow and racism in his writing. And this is just one example I wanted to put in because he didn't just sing and talk about it. It's in all of his diary entrants, all the, unpublished stuff. These are ideas that really live with him every single day. Uh, speaking of which, you asked about it before. In the 1950s, we moved from our Mermaid Avenue Coney Island apartment into Beach Haven, which is an apartment complex in Brighton Beach that was run by Fred Trump and the, fam the Trump family. And when he discovered that there was racism in the renting policies of the group. And it freaked him out. It infuriated him. And he wrote a number of songs and he wrote letters and diary entries and all kinds of things, naming names. And this is the one it's called Beach Haven. That was the name of the apartment complex. Beach Haven ain't my home. Basically, he's saying I can't live here because of the Trump uh, racist policy. And we did move out of there after a year and a half. My father couldn't take it. That's an amazing story. And of course, voting, uh, he was a firm believer. On the right, you see there's a wonderful illustration of what it was like to vote in Oklahoma, <laughs> in Okima at the time. And all well, the candidates, you know, Smith gets six, Jones gets four, there's eight fist fights, uh, missing, 14 missing. So that's uh, politics and election day, but of course, vote if you're still around and lots of cartoons. The guy gets kicked out of his house in his pajamas and his wife says, don't come back till you register to vote. I love this line, uh, one of my favorite lines of his, I don't care how good your good old days was for you, they're not good enough for me. And again, that's a line that sticks in my gut in today's world with the good old days and the ways it was in America, the way it was. We got to return to the good old days. And he's like, uh-uh, no, we got to get out of the good old days and create some more good days. He loved people. This is one of the sections that we have in the book. And just you were asking before about some of the people that he admired and he loved. And uh, this might be a surprise to some people. He did write about people that he heard about in the street. He heard about Joe DiMaggio. He wrote about baseball players. Joe DiMaggio done it again. He wrote about Ingrid Bergman, who you can see there is actually reading Bound for Glory. She got a copy. 
<laughs> but uh, so, you know, whether it was celebrities or baseball players, and then there's one of my favorite songs is Dear Mrs. Roosevelt. When he, when FDR died, uh, he wrote a letter in lyric form to Mrs. Roosevelt. And uh, opposite that, we have a good woman and then a bad woman, Ilse Koch, a woman who worked in Buchenwald, a Nazi. And he wrote one of the first songs actually about being um, a prisoner in a concentration camp. He wrote this in the 1940s. So I don't know if you, you were talking about FDR and how much he appreciated and admired Eleanor and FDR. Well, of course, with the, when he went out to work for the Grand Coulee Dam for the New Deal and wrote up with 26 songs, uh, uh, remarkable, um, uh, rich, artistic uh, vein he tapped when he was in the Pacific Northwest. But Eleanor Roosevelt was a big lover of folk music and folk traditions and was a, a immense fan of Woody Guthrie. And the um, and you know it's such a symbiotic relationship between the two of them. But I when you it, it dawned on me, I wanted to ask you, Nora, the the all the Hanukkah songs that um, that Woody wrote. Is that were those triggered by just being around a Jewish community in New York, or are they triggered more by his learning about the Holocaust and the the crimes of the Nazis? Um, no, they were actually triggered by two relationships that he had. One was with my grandmother. My mother's mother was a Yiddish writer. And so he learned a lot about Jewish culture, et cetera, from her. And uh, I have a, a picture I'll show you that's coming up. If we could just move Anna. Yeah. Okay. Last person, I just want to put in Union Made. We were talking about people, people that he loved, people he admired. Union made number one woman. <laughs> yeah, you know, he, knew, he knew Joe, Joe Hill's uh, Helen Gurley Flynn, the rebel, rebel woman, Joe Hill's rebel woman. And she used to come and tutor him and Pete Seeger and some of the other young folk singers in New York, bringing them Joe Hill's songs and writings. So he mentored to some degree under Joe Hill, even after he had passed away with Helen Gurley Flynn. Union made... I just, I sing it every day now, watching the strikes going on around the country. Uh, bring it back, bring it back, everybody. Go out there and sing. You can't scare me, I'm sticking to the union. And uh, also about people, I'll just mention one other thing. Some, he loved names. And he wrote a number of songs about Sacco and Vanzetti. And one of my favorite is I just want to sing your name. And all he does is repeat, oh, Sacco, Sacco, oh, Niccolo Sacco, oh, Bart Vanzetti, I just want to sing your name. The power of naming names in this way, like a mantra is so beautiful. It's meditative. And he evokes the spirit of Sacco and Vanzetti in this series of songs. This is the simple one. I just want to sing your name. I have nothing else to say. I just want to sing your name. Another song that covers uh, that is people that don't have names. When he wrote about the plane wreck at Los Gatos, where the migrants uh, had, had an airplane crash and the migrants being deported were not named in the news article. And again, I need to know your names. What were your names? What were their names? Years later, this is another aspect of his work that I so admire. Years later, a young historian, a young scholar came and said, you know, I know this song and I've read this article. What were their names? Let's, let's find out. And he wrote a beautiful book called um, What Were Their Names? And he found out the names of all the people that perished in that crash, the deportees. And he gathered their families together and we were able to include all the names next to that lyric. And that's very profound to me, actually, to see that. that profound to me too when I saw that. that. Yeah. So that's another thing that happens with, with his songs. It inspires people to resolve things. He loved people. He did lots of drawings of people. 
These are just examples of some of the faces and the cartoons that he drew of people. And you were talking about before some of the oil paintings that he did early on in California and Texas in the 1930s before the brushes got lost. And this was uh, just, you know, a nice one of Abe Lincoln that he did. That was one of the ones you were asking about. Yeah. He wrote about love. And this is the other thing that I want to stress because people don't think that political people have a love life or something. <laughs> and I just, it's so wonderful. I saw this notebook, Love, In and Out. And then Marjorie is my mother, actually. And I thought it was so great. I've heard so many scholars talking about Woody as the fighter and the unions and this and that. And I go, but he was also a lover. And he wrote love songs and uh, they're beautiful love songs. So this is one, that's a picture of him and my mom when they met. And this is a beautiful lyric called My New York City is the place that I met you. So we try to cover in the book some of the uh, aspects of love that he did. This is another one, one of my favorite called Revolutionary Mind. Now this is a love song for a progressive woman. <laughs> The chorus keeps going. I need a progressive woman. I need an awful liberal woman. I need an open-minded mama to ease my revolutionary mind. <laughs> and it goes on and on. I actually recorded that with Tom Morello. Uh, and I love the fact that love exists through common values and through activism and through these fights that we have to go through. People find each other and love each other through these through these situations. And unfortunately in our society, the only love we get exposed to on television and you know, in the news is like who Kim Kardashian is dating today, that's love, you know? And it's like, okay, maybe that is, maybe that's her kind of love, but there are so many other kinds of love that really need to put the spotlight on. And in Woody's love, he whispers sweet nothings into her ear and he says, I can't wait to see you on the picket line. I can't wait to see you at the rally. You know, it's that kind of love. It's very, very, very deep. And it gets really uh, uncovered and distorted. And I feel bad that especially young people don't get exposed to what, how deep love can be and how people share common values in this way in terms of society all those kids that are out there protesting for gun control, for climate change, they're also finding each other and falling in love. And that's a really strong component of life. He, in a diary entry, I found a wonderful thing where his last line is, and he talks about the, the women being ahead of the men. And he talks about nothing could have been done if it hadn't been for the women. So again, I just wanted to tell the audience that a lot of these writings are diary entries, never been published, never meant to be published. They're really his deepest thoughts. And I, I find them to be some of the most beautiful. So that's love, love is in there, family is in there. All work together with a wiggle and a giggle. He took a lot of his children's lines for his songs from us. This is a typical notebook. There's many of them. Kathy, who was my older sister, uh, he would take down what she said. Kathy said he had a whole book of things she said. One of the things she kept saying was, why? Why is this? Why is that? And he turned it into a wonderful song where you can feel free to ask any kind of question you want. He wrote songs to take you a child as a parent. He wrote songs that take you throughout the day from wake up to sleep by and everything that happens in between. This is one of his original Grow Big songbooks. He was a wonderful father. I just want to say that clearly. Uh, he, he was a stay at home father. My mom was a dancer with the Martha Graham Company and was on tour actually quite a lot. And he was the one who was home taking care of us, writing songs with us and doing art with us. So here he is in Brooklyn babysitting, watching the kids. He wrote lullabies for us. He wrote birth announcements for us. Some people have fathers that play baseball with them. And our father did a lot of art with us and did a lot of music with us. 
uh, one of my favorite pages in his archive is this page called New Multitudes. And it's really affirming that children, the next generation are to be honored, are to be supported because we need new multitudes to keep making this world better and better. His religion, spirituality, we have a chapter. He calls it, I got me sort of a one man religion. My religion is so big, no matter who you are, you're in it. And no matter what you do, you can't get out of it. Unions, my religion, he writes, all kinds of union between human beings, between organizations, between workers and, and employers, etc. He writes a lot of songs about that being his religion. But you asked before about the Jude Judas, Jewish side of it. Uh, through the influence of my grandmother, he discovered Judaism, looked into it, wrote a lot of songs about Jewish topics, Jewish culture. And one of the cutest ones is called Nash O Nash. G-O-G, gosh, oh gosh, I'm gonna nash on a humantash. <laughs> <laughs> So we try to go into a little bit of the spiritual side of Woody and the humorous, you know, the humorous side of religion, as well as the serious side of spirituality. And of course, talk and world peace is one of his notebook entries. Again, that was, uh, that was the, what he wanted most of all. We end a little bit with New Year's rulings which is, again, I put it in a spiritual context because it's all about learning how to live. I'll go back to Bob Dylan's quote. You listen to his songs, you learn how to live. You hang out with Woody and you can learn how to live. So he had written up this uh, New Year's rulings that covers just about anything because you have to work, you have to work by a schedule, but you also have to brush your teeth, if any. You know, a lot of things to do. Don't get lonesome, keep your house clean. Keep your hoping machine running, one of my favorite lines. So I'll just kind of end on that note, I think. Keep your hoping machine running, everybody. Absolutely. Nora, what an incredibly fun presentation. And um, I'm going to open it up to questions. I'll ask one just to kind of um, kick it off. But that was beautifully done. And thank you for taking the time to let us see the visuals because the book is so rich with it. Um, what was it, tell us about his um, the number of artists you've met over the years. Um, they come to you, I know, to just talk about Woody. Um, it, you've got to know every performer possible. Is there a moment when you think somebody's having like a Woody epiphany? They need to, you know, that come to you and just want to look at Woody's artifacts and, and talk to you about him? Well, I've lived through this my whole life, actually, you know, from knowing Sonny Terry and, and Brownie McGee um, in the early 50s, uh, their work with my father and on to Pete Seeger, who I lived and grew up with, Ramblin' Jack Elliott, a lot of the early folk people. And then the next crowd came, the Bob Dylans and the John Cohen, New Los City Ramblers and that crowd. So I, I feel like I've spent my whole life um, in, in relationship with people who keep discovering him in different ways but in different eras too, you know, yeah. the same things happening at different times. So the timing of everything is really kind of beautiful and it keeps happening, you know, to this day, I'll get a call from somebody who just discovered something about Woody and maybe it's a 15 year old or a 20 year old and they're just discovering something that's in relationship to some of the issues that we just talked about today. So, you know, from A to Z, I've worked with them all, I've known them all and, um, yeah, there. Okay. Now I have um, uh, one question here about um, Woody's guitars. You mentioned um, with the, um, you know, this machine kills fascist. Is there an existing guitar that he had or do we, is there such a thing as a Woody Guthrie guitar? I think they're asking. Yeah, there's no such thing as Lucille in Woody no. Guthrie. <laughs> I'm sorry. He, he, uh, had very inexpensive guitars. He would pawn them and pick up another one at another shop. The guitar that you're seeing behind me is from 
uh, probably the 1950s. It's not my dad's guitar, but it was in a room where all of my dad's friends came and played. So if I ever do a DNA test, there's probably some really interesting uh, people that played that guitar for many decades, but it was not actually my father's guitar. There are one or two, actually, I should say in the Tulsa Museum, they've uncovered one or two from his early days that survived and they are there in Tulsa. Okay. Um, question about Jimmy Lefebvre. Did you, um, uh, who did, passed not too long ago, they're wanting to know if you um, knew him and if you've heard his recordings on Woody Guthrie. Oh, of course, I knew him really well. I have a picture of him right here. Uh, oh, really? I, I oh, can't. yeah. Well, it's right over there. So I can't get up and show it to you. But I knew Jimmy very, very well. And I worked with him on a number of songs. He recorded a number of Woody's unpublished lyrics. I've spent about 30 years working with artists with unpublished lyrics. It started with Wilco and Billy Bragg and on and on and on. And I also had the opportunity of working with Jimmy. He was kind of like a brother to me in many ways. I love him a lot and uh, miss him a lot. I did a lot of songs with him. Um, they want to know, if, is there a spot in New York to go to for Woody Guthrie for This Land is Your Land? I guess they mean like a plaque or something. No, uh, there is no plaque. <laughs> there is a corner. And the corner is 43rd Street and 6th Avenue on the northwest corner of 43rd and 6th Avenue. And sometimes I go there, actually, and I just stand there and I go, so, Dad, this is where it all happened, huh? I did create a book. If anyone wants to go to our website, by the way, it's woodyguthrie.org. I did a, a book about different locations in New York City where Woody wrote different songs. With I have a picture of the original flop house in there where he wrote This Land is Your Land and Pretty Boy Floyd. He wrote Jesus Christ there in that flop house. Uh, so you can go on our website, and if you're really interested in seeing some of the locations where these songs were written in New York City, it's called My Name is New York. That's the book and a CD that I did. Very good, yeah. And uh, one wants to know about um, thanking, I guess, the Guthries for bringing attention to Huntington's disease. Can you comment on what Huntington's disease is for people that don't know and about Woody's affliction with it? Yeah, it's a neurological disorder that is fatal. And my dad lived with it for 15 years in hospitals. Uh, we would bring him home on weekends to meet with friends and have nannies. But it's a slowly, slowly degenerate, degenerative disorder where you lose control of your facilities, of your body, speech, et cetera. And uh, I would say the first you know, half of my life was spent taking care of him, you know, just taking him home from the hospital, feeding him, clothing him, washing him, and making sure that his friends were around. And when Dylan first came to New York, he got in touch with us and my mother was able to direct him to the hospital. He was one of the caretakers actually in those early days, which is, my heart really goes out to Bob for that. We saw him last night. At oh, the really? Of New York. Oh, yeah, we saw the show, lovely. saw the show. And I sit there and it's funny, everyone's like the songs, the song, the song. And our family, we look at him and I go, thanks for visiting my dad. You know, thanks for being one of the caretakers in his life. It was very important to me. Uh, can I just mention also, there were people were asking about if there's a place in New York. Also, I might mention that starting in February, the Morgan Library is doing a big exhibit on my dad, on Woody. It's curated by the Tulsa Museum people and myself, our team here, and Bob Santelli, who's one of the co-authors of this book. And it's gonna run at the Morgan Library from February through May. So if you do live in New York, or if you get a chance to come up to New York, a lot of this stuff that's in this book is gonna be on display at the Morgan, the original material. Very good. I'm hoping to be up there for that. and and. Um... Here's one says, uh, Deportees, one of my favorite Woody songs, sadly, um, timely with the question of immigration in recent years. To ask a question I've heard, what would Woody do? I guess they're wondering what their, your father would do about our immigration situation in America. 
he would do what he always did, which was to be where it's happening, singing for the people, writing songs about the people. Uh, he was a hands-on kind of guy. He did not have a writing studio where he went to isolate himself uh, and write creative things. He was out on the street all the time. My mother used to laugh. She'd say he would go out for a pack of cigarettes and come home two weeks later because at the store, he ran into someone who said, there's a rally down the block. Oh, let's go. And then from there, there's another one happening in Pennsylvania. Let's go. Uh, so he was, uh, he was always out there on the front lines. And I am sure that he would be in all of these locations where these things are happening today. Very good. Uh, there's a Leslie Wiseman. Uh, I say her name because it's a very specific question. She's wondering if you could say something about the ballad of Isaac Woodward. The horror of that young black soldier's experience has renewed renaissance today. And your father's song is a searing and, and meaningful now as it was then. In our chapter on people, we include, again, some of the people that he wrote about, including Isaac Woodard uh, was his name. My father mis miswrote his name in the lyric. He wrote Woodward, but the guy's name was Isaac Woodard. Uh, he wrote about uh, Harriet Tubman. He wrote a lot of people that the heroes of the civil rights movement, um, et cetera. And Isaac Woodard, you can see in the book, the original lyric about him as well. Um, this one is about Bound for Glory. James Wilson just wants to know what was it? Um, and could you say more about the Ingrid Bergman photo? Did they ever meet? Did she know him? So what is Bound for Glory in case somebody and, um, you know, is, is new to it? And then I, maybe Ingrid Bergman follow up. Bound for Glory is a novel he wrote. It's autobiographical that covers his childhood and then his coming to New York, getting on the trains and traveling. Um, it's a wonderful piece of writing. He wrote it in 1943, it came out. And he did know a lot of the people, Ingrid Bergman, a lot of the other um, actors and people in theater were also part of the um, left-wing movement, uh, right at the cusp of the McCarthy period when that's coming. And so they were connected. I, I can't say that he ever met her personally, but there were a lot of connections that they shared with this. You know, the, the left-wing movement was very, very, very powerful in America before the McCarthy period uh, put, a, you know, put an end to it. Um, the country was really going towards a more equitable uh, society. And she was part of that. A lot of the other actors, et cetera, were part of that McCarthy, pre-McCarthy period movement. So yeah, she enjoyed Bound for Glory very much. And he enjoyed Ingrid very much <laughs> <laughs> on film. <laughs> well, and, um, and everybody read Bound for Glory if you haven't. It's just such an, an important American memoir. Um, here's so, one about how's your working experience with Wilco and Billy Bragg? Could you say that again? They want to know about your working experience with Wilco and Billy Bragg. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, that, I did a couple uh, recordings with the band, with Billy and Wilco, and uh, we did three albums all, all together using, it was the first project that really used my father's unpublished lyrics that I was able to gather and they were able to come to the archive and research, et cetera. And between all of us, we came up with like 40 songs you know, that, and that was Mermaid Avenue. It was really very chancy because no one had ever done anything like that. And I swear to God, if it bombed, <laughs> I would have been in real trouble. <laughs> but uh, luckily it, it started a whole, um, it started a whole wave of me being able to work with musicians and set some of these unpublished lyrics to, to music. We've done, I don't know, about 300, I guess so far. Um, Nora, we're going to have to wrap it up. You are, we have many unanswered questions, um, but where our time is up and it, everybody, the raves are coming in from, uh, from the, some saying it's one of the best talks they've ever heard of politics and prose. And thank you, Nora. Happy Thanksgiving to you. The book is Woody Guthrie. Everybody make sure you order it now and get it. And politics and prose is the kind of bookstore Woody Guthrie 
would have loved because they carry such a wide variety of authors and it's a perfect place um, to support um, this really re remarkable book. If you get this, it'll stay with you forever. It's nothing transitory about it. It's uh, unlike Woody who moved around a lot, this book will stick right to your rib <laughs> because it, it is rich and uh, the amount of effort you and Bob Santelli did is greatly appreciated. Take care, Nora. Thanks everybody. Thanks for Sean for hosting us. Thank oh, absolutely. You. And on behalf of Politics and Pros, I'd like to say thank you for not only just a wonderful event, but for sharing your father with all of us. Hey. Um, <laughs> and this, this is very, uh, one of the best ones I've ever experienced. Uh -huh. So on behalf of Politics and Pros, I'd like to say to everyone, stay well and stay well read. And we'll see you guys another time. I like that. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> Take care.